Yeah. Hil yeah. Uh, Hillary. Uh, thank you. A uh, quick question related to that. Um, Dr. Lupin, uh, and this might be something that Dr. Mikovits might be uh, eager to speak about, which is that the uh, this research has obviously opened up uh, a lot of uh, hints and clues for future avenues of, of therapies. The cytokine footprint or the disease footprint uh, may have opened up uh, uh, new avenues uh, with uh, peptide T, GCMAF, uh, et cetera. C can you or someone on the panel talk about uh, where uh, therapies might be directed in the future? So I, that's a very good point. So um, this actually harkens back to something that uh, Dr. Alter was talking about just a few minutes ago. And I think, and Frank and, and Judy resonated with this as well. There are, um, not everyone who's exposed to the same infectious agent has the same response. Um, this has been shown in humans, it's been shown in animal models, so we know it's a real phenomenon. And how you respond is a function of many things. Your genetic background, the way your genes have been modified, your nutritional status, what infectious agents you've seen, what toxins you've seen, and so on. You can use some of these new uh, methods for analyzing the proteins that are present in the blood not just cytokines and chemokines, but other proteins uh, that have yet to be defined. You can look at, look at different gene products like different types of RNAs. All of these will provide insights into pathways that are differentially regulated in some people than others. And therefore, even without necessarily knowing the infectious agent, you may be able to modify the response. The response may be, in fact, what is the problem? It may not even be so much the agent per se. And the agent need not even be present at the time that the disease is manifest. So you can show with animal models and very sophisticated animal models that a process can be set in motion early in life that manifests decades later as cancer, mental illness, abnormal responses to other infectious agents, what have you. So the big focus really will be on integration of three components. What Mady Hornick likes to talk about is the three strikes hypothesis. The genes, the environment, and the timing all interacting in concert to result in some outcome. And you can intervene at various steps along that process to modulate it to improve the outcomes. Now. If people respond well to some drug, the question is why? If you can exclude a placebo effect, which can in fact be substantial, and that's why we need clinical trials, then that may provide some insights into which pathways are aberrant, and that may give you insights into how the disease process evolves and ways to prevent either disease in the first place or to, to mitigate it. Is that clear? Yes. Okay, thank you. I think we'll probably just take two more questions uh, and and that's it. Unless there was something else you wanted to put forward, Seekon. Please, I, I can't read your name tag. My name is Jay Spiro. Um, could you speak to any um, clinician input that you might have received in designing the study or planning it? Yes. So the, the study was conceived in stages. Um, we gathered first the laboratory and the laboratory people uh, represented here as well as Bill Switzer and a couple of others and we went over the various lab tests and we identified amongst ourselves who we thought the leading clinicians might be who would be able to participate in a study of this sort. So I mentioned the names of those individuals and there were six of them. Uh, Tony Komaroff who's been studying chronic fatigue now for decades, uh, Nancy Klimas, uh, so he's at, he's at Harvard Nancy Klimas in Miami, Cindy Bateman in Salt Lake, Dan Peterson, who was part of the original team that described the syndrome in Incline uh, Village, Jose Montoya, very well known to uh, many of you, and uh, for his work primarily on herpes viruses, and then uh, Sue Levine, who's here in New York City. So they all met and had input, um, not only from themselves, but also from um, 
uh, Suzanne Vernon from CFIDS, who participated in helping to generate some ideas about what sorts of things might be important. We then came up w with what we thought was the minimal definition that we would use, and then we went further. Again, what we tried to do was to make certain that the people we identified to participate in the study would be the ones who would be most likely to have an infectious agent at the foundation of the onset of the illness. So we emphasized fever, malaise, night sweats, lymphadenopathy, weight loss, um, and so on. All those individuals were brought in. We had laboratory tests performed. The reason we don't have 150 people in each of the two groups is that some of the individuals, despite having uh, a history that was not remarkable for things like hypothyroidism or cryptic hepatitis or anything like that, in fact, did have those disorders. So we had to delete those from the pool because we wanted to be certain that there wasn't something else that might somehow um, detract from the power of the study that we were doing. So the decision on who to recruit was made by the clinicians. The decision on the laboratory tests to do was made by the laboratory investigators. The decision about where to eat dinner and how to write up the paper was made by me. And where did you eat dinner? McDonald's. <laughs> Hillary? I think there's a question in the back. Is there, is there another question in the back? One, one more there's question. Um, there's a question from Martin Ensrink from Science. Yes. And the question is directed towards Megavitz and Rossetti. <clears throat> Can you explain why the many uh, failed attempts to replicate your 2009 study, the coffin pathic paper about XMRV's origins, and the blood working group study published in 2011 um, failed to convince you that your 2009 paper was wrong? And what sets this new study apart? I think we've already been over that ad nauseum. Okay. You know, so uh, we've talked about the fact that the first study was not appropriately powered. We've talked about the fact that the other studies did not allow them to do exactly what they wanted to do and the way they wanted to do it. Um, I don't know that there's really anything else to add to that, is there? No. Uh, Frank or Judy? No. no. Okay, well, I think, I think, as I say, I think we've addressed that question. Um, last question, Hillary. Thank you. Uh, I'll keep this short, but I'm, I'm trying to focus on uh, what, what were the good things that came, came from this work. Uh, uh, and uh, we've, we've seen that XMRV is it, a chimera, as it's been described. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, isn't this somewhat worrisome in that, you know, we've seen how rapidly uh, XMRV can replicate in human cells. We saw what XMRV did in, in the rhesus macaques. Uh, and we are still using um, MLV uh, and gamma, gamma, gamma retrovirus research in creating uh, uh, recombinants and vaccine therapy. Um, d d has this has this uh, experience caused people at NIH? Maybe you could speak to this, or Dr. Rochetti, and, or, and uh, has this caused people at NIH to be somewhat concerned and, and even alarmed about the fact that these recombinants can occur in in, in the lab? That there can be man-made uh, chimera slash viruses. Uh, so, the, so there's a term that's used uh, to describe this. It's called gain-of-function research. Uh, and it's come up most recently in the context of H5N1, the work that was done in Rotterdam and, uh, and in Wisconsin and in Japan in generating recombinant influenza viruses that appear to have uh, more virulence, more transmissibility in models, in ferret models. Uh, and this is an issue that's being addressed by the scientific community. There is no clear uh, pathway for this as yet. It's being uh, developed at a very at very high levels, in fact, uh, within the World Health Organization. So this is something because whenever you're creating new viruses that have potential to infect humans, there is the issue of how that should be addressed and how that should be contained. Now I can tell you that with respect to H5N1, in the same journal in which our work has appeared, uh, the journal MBio, there will be an, a, uh, a series of reports at the end of this month 
that tackle this issue. And there will be people speaking for H5N1 recombinant research at various levels, people speaking vociferously against it, and people who are in the middle who are talking about doing work of that sort under high-level containment. And, and all those different perspectives will be addressed, debated in MBIO, uh, and I encourage you to wait for that. It'll be coming up in about a week's time. And there will be a press release, and I'll probably be participating in that one as well. Uh, but it won't be here. But in any event, um, that is with a disease that you know, is, is acute, right? It's something that causes disease very, very rapidly. But I think the same arguments, the same principles are at play, whether you're talking about something that causes acute or chronic illness. And this is something that the scientific community and the community at large is going to have to wrestle with and make decisions about. Very good point. Well, let me first thank you all for attending. And I particularly want to acknowledge my colleagues, Harvey Alter, Judy Mikovits, Frank Rochetti, Mady Hornig, uh, and people who could not be with us, Shailene Lowe, uh, at the FDA, and Bill Switzer and his colleagues at the CDC, and of course all the, the clinicians who I've just named uh, just a moment ago. Thank you very much.